While many races in the universe of the 41st millennium have deeply travelled, explored and established a heavy footprint across the galaxy, the same cannot be said for the upstart forces of the Xenos race known as the Tau. They are a comparatively young race who, unlike the Imperium, have developed and advanced their technology giving significant power to their burgeoning empire. Today we will overview the race known as the Tau. The Tau were originally discovered in the latter part of the 35th millennium by an exploratory fleet of the Adeptus Mechanicus. At this time the Tau were noted and recorded as being a fairly innocuous species who were seen only to have recently begun using simple tools as well as having learned to make safe fire. They were clearly at the very early stage of development whereas the Imperium of Man was already reuniting planets that had conquered millennia before. The planet the Tau inhabited at this time was also identified as being usable as a resource world by the Imperium and at any other time this primitive race would have been subsequently eradicated from the planet so that it could be prepared and colonised by humanity in preparation for the extraction of its resources. The Tau though, through a significant amount of luck, would travel a different path. Some might call it fate, for this xenophobic purging by the race of mankind would not occur. Violent warp storms would erupt around the Tau homeworld before the Imperium would have a chance to cleanse the planet and the outbreak of the Age of Apostasy would descend on humanity as well. This was a power struggle between the Ecclesiarchy and the High Lords of Terror as well as others who sought to exploit the internal struggles of the Imperium and would additionally prevent any further return to the Tau homeworld. To compound things and how often this is the case with Imperium record keeping, the planet would be archived and forgotten about, buried in the seas of bound paper and labyrinths of archives that is the Imperial Administratum. The Imperium in short order forgot about these exploratory notations in order to pay far closer attention to more pressing attentions within its own ranks. 6,000 years would pass until a ship of unknown determination would appear at Devlin in the Ultima Segmentum. After failing to identify itself, the ship was destroyed by the Imperial Navy. Bodies were recovered and examined, they were assessed, cross-referenced with Imperial records, and showed a significant match with a long since forgotten about 6,000 year old report that described a primitive race who had barely advanced beyond the earliest beginnings of civilization. If this was in fact the same race that had been described millennia before, it was of an urgent and immediate concern to the Imperium. Seeing such fast advancement in the Xenos race, from using stone tools to building starships and voyaging into the darkness of space within only a few millennia was troubling and would require prioritised exploration and information gathering by the Imperium. Subsequent investigations found that even some human worlds that were in proximity to the Tau system had already begun trading with these Xenos somehow. And enough was enough. The Damocles Crusade would begin and initiate the first state of war between humanity and the Tau Empire. The Tau are an unusual race by the standards of the 41st millennium, for they are neither a race of bloodthirsty, instinct-driven monsters seeking purely an ever-ongoing plague of war, nor are they irrationally xenophobic or choose to base their way of life around some grandiose ideology of either conquering those who resist them or the absolute destruction of all. They do though seek the expansion of their empire and through force if necessary. For the Tau, all their societal directions are governed by an overarching philosophy they refer to as the greater good. As stated, unlike other races in the darkness of the future, the Tau do not by default seek to eradicate other species as a matter of course, but they do aim to spread their philosophy, culture and territory. They do want to grow and further their civilization, to put it simply. Those individuals or planets who are unwilling or unable to open their minds to the benefits of the greater good are likely to face some form of more forceful persuasion, first diplomatically, and if this should fail or reach an impasse, then through physical force. The greater good is at the core of Tau culture because it dictates and influences everything from their civilian life to diplomacy and warfare. The greater good is also known as the Tau Va, and this combination of philosophical and quasi-religious principles governs much of what the Tau feel they must do and helps maintain their structure and lives. It operates around a caste-based social stratification system, which means that essentially a Tau's role in life is dictated by hereditary transmission into a certain workforce or lifestyle. Ultimately, these are embedded social classes in Tau society that ensure the majority of Tau have very little in the way of personal choice 
choices. However, it has been stated that Tao all have the free will to choose their own destiny and the fact that they choose to serve the greater good and their lot in life is merely a testament to how righteous a path it is that all Tao choose to live by its teachings. In some ways this is not entirely unlike the Imperium across many worlds. For the Tao though it is more embedded as a principle and taught as a fundamental balancer for their lives. For this reason it is more accepted and brings a sense of focus and serenity for many Tao, who were born never having to make a decision about what they should do, they will learn their place and then focus on carrying out that role to the best of their ability for their lives. Instead of either destroying or on occasion crushing into submission enemies as the Imperium does, the Tao rather seek to absorb others into their collective. This concept to most of the other races in the galaxy seems entirely unthinkable. However, it has been rumoured that pockets of Imperial forces who have been cut off from all other help, instead of making the correct choice of fighting to the death and have actually allowed themselves to be absorbed into the Tau Empire and now live within their society. And these individuals are to the surprise of no one seen by the servants of the Imperium as heretics and they should be purged and exterminated at the earliest opportunity, not before likely receiving an extremely thorough interrogation. The fundamental premise of the greater good, generally speaking, is that everyone within the Empire will work to the benefit of everyone else, to better the Tao's position in the galaxy and their collective quality of life. Because of ideals and the way by which the Tao unusually amalgamate other species into their society, they now already contain multiple other species as part of their collective. These include the Crute, a savage species of bird-like warriors, Vespids, a strange insect-like species who utilise crystalline-based technologies, while the Crute appear to have more like mercenary tendencies, the Vespid actually believe in the ideology of the greater good, and when fighting alongside the Tao will contribute to one another far more of a morale boosting effect. The Tau have also adopted a species known as the Nikasa, a nomadic race who are powerful psychers, and they are travellers in space. The Tau use them near exclusively for this role of transporting through space. They are highly psychic entities and consequently the Tau concealed their existence from their enemies and are only used for space travel purposes, not combat. The Nikasa contribute mainly ships towards the Tau navy for exploration and scouting purposes. In addition to these absorbed races of the Tau Empire, there are also previously stated human sects that exist within the Tau Collective as well. Conquered humans who by all rights should have chosen death rather than the heretical dishonour of serving the Tau. There are even those who have joined the Tau of their own free will, impressed by the concept of the greater good, as opposed to the more severe nature of the Imperium. And as you would expect, these individuals are considered extreme traitors to the Imperium, and if discovered would be shown little mercy and suffer the worst of Imperial Inquisitors, or simply executed on the spot. While their ideological, philosophical and societal organisation is of interest and highly contrasting to the Imperium of Man in many ways, the most concerning element of the Tau for humanity is their technological advances and the speed with which they have advanced their hardware. Within a short period of just a few thousand years, the Tau, as stated, have advanced from using basic tools, making fire and learning how to create basic foundational mechanics and engineering, to a transformation of an advanced spacefaring race with powerful weaponry and exosuits that are at the very least concerning to the Imperium. Far more worrying though is the possibility that if they were able to continue their current pace of research and development they could advance beyond the weaponry and war gear of the Imperium which has largely due to ever expanding religious dogma allowed itself to stagnate and barely develop anything new that is until the most current period in human history. By contrast, the Tau have already become one of the more technologically dependent races in the galaxy, and given the Imperium's stubborn inability to move forward technologically until very recently with the return of the previously stasis entombed Ultramarine's Primarch, now returned to his place as Lord Commander of the Imperium, the Imperium is beginning to drag itself up out of the mud every step forward, requiring apparently agonising effort. The Tau, though, may be inexperienced but they're not fools, and ever since their initial contact with human settlements, they have played a highly tactical game of infiltration and suggestion to allow them to begin trading and eventually absorb some human worlds in their system as part of the Tau Empire. Yet these worlds were the dissident fringes of the human empire. Some worlds were even forgotten human colonies who had no real sense of themselves as being part of a larger Imperium of Man. It took the Tau some time to grasp the 
understanding that there was a far greater and more powerful collected human society, and that if they were not cautious, could bring down a wrath they would not be able to defend against. So their initial steps were tentative, but would become progressively more confident. Some have seen fit to suggest that the Tau's speedy development of technology could be down to their locating a lost human STC system, but there's nothing to support this suggestion, and if it were true in any sense, you would imagine their developments would already be far more advanced than they are. The Tau simply demonstrate what can be achieved by a collective focused sense of purpose and unified drive towards specifically directed goals. If the Imperium had not critically hamstrung itself in religious dogma and bureaucracy, then it may also have been able to achieve far more than it has done over the past millennia, where instead it allowed itself to decay and rot from the inside. So this threat of being outpaced by an upstart race who should by the Emperor's will have been exterminated millennia ago is a sting in the side of the Imperium, far more than the actual literal impact of the Tau. With that said, it is worth noting that the Tau have already proven their ability to hold the line against the Imperium, only further compounding the sense that the Tau are considered an ever-growing threat to the stability of the Imperium. Perhaps not a critical threat in the current moment to be sure, but it would be more than fair to say that unless things begin to change, the threat the Tau represent as well as being all too aware of having missed a golden opportunity to eradicate them in the past, down to nothing more than petty human infighting between their internal divisions mean that the Tau are ever more irritating to the Imperium, and while additionally becoming even more dangerous a threat, the longer mankind waits to crush the Tau, the more difficult and dangerous that task will likely become. Worse though, as Inquisitor Gallius would come to realise, that the Tau exhibited a naivety not seen in other races, a distinct lack of understanding of the galaxy, its events and their place in it. Their technological advancements were matched only by their ignorance in the dangers of over-reliance on technology. Such things brought to the Inquisitor's mind scripts that he had read that described mankind before the Dark Age of Technology. And while so much knowledge of this time is lost, it is believed that mankind's fundamental faith in technology and the over-reliance on machines caused the downfall of humanity and threatened to spread out beyond. If the Tau were already on a path to developing ever more advanced technology, it was surely only a matter of time before they began to develop that which the Imperium and humanity place among their most severe fears, the development of artificial intelligence, abominable intelligence. To that end, the Tau represent a clear and present danger to the Imperium of Man and perhaps the entire galaxy beyond what many could imagine. Like many races, the Tau began as an ununified species whose tribal groups would periodically spar with one another. They would have their own territorial space and defend it against those who infringed upon it. And in these early times, the Tau were formed of four specific castes who were continually warring with each other. And the severity of these skirmishes added with the uncompromising nature of the Tau at this time is said to have risked the very survival of them as a species. And this period of brutal warring is known as the Mon Tau. It all began during a conflict between some Tau warriors of the plains and those of a fortress city, Fio Tom. The plains Tau had assaulted and subsequently set up an encampment around the city, but negotiations had failed. The Plains Warrior Tower would not be satisfied until the entire city lay in ruins and its citizens were broken and slaughtered. The conflict went on for years, and despite holding out as best they could, the inhabitants of the city began to fall victim to deteriorating health and ever worsening living conditions. Starvation, disease were starting to take hold, and the situation looked bleak for the citizens of the city. However, it was at this time that two mysterious individuals would appear. One of these figures would walk steadily but confidently out from the enveloping darkness in complete silence, approaching the circled encampment of the Plains Warrior Tau and speaking calmly and softly, he would explain that he required to speak with their camp's commander. The guards to the camp found themselves unexplainably compelled to comply by this figure's confident and authoritative use of language. At the same time, another similar guard would appear in the besieged city and approach the guards within. When questioned as to how he'd been able to enter the lockdown city, he simply refused to answer, but instead requested to speak directly with the Castellan of the fortress city. Despite the years of bitter fighting between the two groups of Tau, the strangers came into the centre of the conflict with a dignified sincerity and overwhelming calm confidence about them that radiated onto those around them. This strength of presence, combined with their skillful abilities in diplomacy, 
left both the attackers and defenders ready to begin new peace negotiations within hours. The gates of the city were swung open, and as the party of defending Tau walked out for the first time in years, a party from the encamped Plains Tau also approached. These mysterious strangers initiated the first talks between these sides in years, and as they spoke they would highlight the positive traits of both sides, and that if they could only consider uniting their strengths together, they could, instead of slowly weakening one another, achieve a form of collective forward progression that would be a greater good for all. This description obviously skims what must have been a more powerful event than just such simple words. The two figures had a certain power over the other tower around them, and as they spoke to their philosophy extensively beneath a pure white moon that illuminated the figures as they talked long into the night, and as the sun broke over the horizon the next day, a previously unthinkable situation had been achieved. A truce had been drawn between the two warring sides. These previously unseen Tau are now referred to as the first ethereals. This singular instance was just the beginning though. More ethereals would appear after the success of Fjotan and collectively reach out to spread their message of peace and for the struggle to achieve a greater good for all Tau. Where previously only bitter battles and skirmishing warfare had existed, now would come peace and a new sense of uplifting inspiration by the philosophy of the ethereals. The fast spread and uptake of the ethereal outlook was prophetic and would only take one year in the Tau calendar for it to unite all Tau across their homeworld, and it would drive them toward a strengthened sense of unity and a progressively positive outlook, the likes of which had never been seen before. Construction, communication, commerce would be some of the very early benefits as the Tau sought to bring all their individual caste skills to the collective betterment of all. The Plains Warrior Tau were the most difficult to ultimately convince that this was the right path forward, but upon seeing the positive construction nature that was being achieved by all the other Tau, this was enough to convince them that this new philosophy was the way forward for them, and they would join the new Tau Empire in its collective quest for the greater good. The newly reformed race of Tau was now comprised of five castes. The Earth caste of builders and artisans, the Water caste of traders and merchants, the Air caste of scouts and communication experts, and the Fire caste, those warriors of the plains. The fifth caste are of course the Ethereals, the unifying force in the Tau civilization, and they are in this sense the superior individuals, the elites. They are the fifth elements in the Tau caste, because they are the unifiers. Unfortunately, while this all sounds very positive and progressive for the Tau, there are it seems more sinister and speculative elements to the Ethereals. Many theories whirl as to their origin, one being that the Eldar have genetically influenced them so as to have a role in the direction of the general Tau populace and get them moving in a forward direction, so as to have another force that would assist in dealing with the many threats of the galaxy, including the Imperium, Orcs, Chaos, and so on. There is though little direct evidence of this. The possibility of the Eldar having seen potentially some early race and then taking the initiative to spark their forward evolution is quite a delicious theory when you consider that the end goals of this could be for the Eldar to try and ensure that if they don't survive the horrors that are consuming the galaxy, there remains another force to contend with, and more importantly, a force that do not make the same mistakes that they themselves have, a society focused around a cooperative, shared goal instead of individualised, selfish desires which near totally destroyed the Eldar race. Secondly, to create a species who have near to no presence in the warp, and are as such considerably more resistant to the dangers of the Chaos Gods and the warp itself, something which has already ruined the Eldar multiple times over, as they themselves were seeded and guided by the Old Ones, with the goal of deliberately forging a race of powerful psychers. All of this though, highly speculative and based on very few fragments of interpretation, so it's anybody's guess as to their true origin, and perhaps it is ultimately, as is usually the case, all the more a banal explanation. Perhaps one day we'll know the truth. The more disturbing aspect of Tau society though has revealed itself over time, and is far from being a theory, it's surely clear now for all to see, no matter how unpalatable the truth may be to Tau loyalists. There is plenty of evidence as to the issue of the ethereals, that they have not so simply presented a positive and unifying philosophy that all Tau then miraculously decide of their own will to abide by. And the more you consider that, the more it makes so little logical sense as to be dismissed with or without evidence. We hear this tale of how this fifth Tau cast appears out of nowhere, and only with a few words end savage conflicts that showed only bitterness and no signs of ending. And then overnight they all lay down their arms and decide they're all friends again, and now it's time to work together. Please, only the most naive could believe such a tale. 
Interrogations and autopsies by the Imperium, as well as documented accounts, have with solid reasoning that without the presence of an ethereal, the Tau are more than likely to revert to a state of self-determination and directly abandon the philosophy of the greater good. This runs in complete contradiction to the official Tau line, that all Tau understand by its very nature that the greater good is what they must and will willingly dedicate their whole lives to, as there is no other logical choice to make. The fact that this is demonstrably untrue suggests a very uncomfortable truth. But if suggested, any Tau would immediately and strongly dismiss, and a reasoning that Ethereals have no explanation for and become suspiciously silent over if pressed to answer. The truth that the Ethereals are essentially a coordinating class, and it is they who enable the Tau to function as a unified collective. I'd be sure much to the Tau's horror that if they took the time to really consider this, they in actuality operate not so unlike the Tyranids with their hive mind. And how this is achieved by the Ethereals is unknown. Imperial biologists have suggested that the diamond shape organ in the centre of their foreheads plays some role, but results as to its purpose have yielded inconclusive results. Other theories speculate that the Ethereals control the lower ranked Tau with some biological chemical means exuding like a pheromone or even some low level latent psychic ability, except that the Tau as far as we know have no real psychers in their own race. Now whether this collective control is a more passive influence, leading the lower caste to simply be more open to suggestion, or if it is in fact a far more aggressive and enslaving sense of control, is open to discussion. I lean more towards the sense that it lies somewhere between this direct control and passive suggestion suggestion that perhaps some Tau are more easily influenced than others. It's also possible that for many Tau this guidance is only partly necessary. The strength of an ideology can be very persuasive, and maybe the ethereals are only needed to keep your average Tau in check. There's no disputing though that those who exist within the Tau Empire are living a lie, whether they know it or not. And this is evidenced by the fact that Tau who are cut off from their ethereals seem to revert to a pre-greater good sense of individuality, which if the Tau's ideology is to be believed and taken as they themselves describe it, seems extremely extremely unlikely. If you were absolutely convinced and indoctrinated into your society's ideology and philosophies, why would you then so abruptly abandon this at the first opportunity, and more specifically doing so when ethereals are absent? It clearly points towards ethereals having a far more proactive and sustained process of mental control over the lower Tau castes. And you can also look at how some allied races within the Tau Empire, such as the Vespid, will wear communion helms that are in air quotes for communication, read, in actuality, necessary ongoing mental manipulation and control. The conclusion to take away is that the Tau are in actuality far from being an advanced and civilized race. It's simply their propaganda. They are not unified by a philosophy or logical ideology that all conveniently agree to live by without question for the positive betterment of others. They are instead quite tragically more like an enslaved race of minions, similar even to the Tyranids or the Necron. They exist tethered to the Ethereals by a force ultimately unknown and who without their presence would likely resort to smashing each other's skulls in just as they had done in the past, or at the very least just going off and doing their own things. Near all the Tau's achievements and the speed of these have been thanks to their collective cooperation, and it's likely that without the Ethereals, the Tau would face obliteration by the Imperium and the other arguably more vicious Xenos inhabiting the galaxy. In many ways, bearing this in mind, you may consider to yourself, well, this is surely a good thing. The Ethereals enabling the Tau to collectively achieve what they could not on their own, and allow them to function and come together as a constructive force. And as with so many events that occur in the bleak darkness of the far future, it is in fact more often the apparently positive events which can on further reflection reveal a far darker narrative once you begin to scratch away the surface. The Tau in that regard are no exception. Constructive achievements, yes, but paying a high price of mental enslavement, never being their true selves? How aware are they of this fact, and how aware are the Ethereals? It's very difficult to say, but the Tau they for sure are able to think for themselves, formulate decisions, intent, invent, but it's the way in which they're unified that is an uncomfortable reality. Now, I've seen many state that the Tau are the closest thing that exists to having a race led by a positive constructive hope in the 41st millennium, and in truth this only works if you ignore and dismiss the fact that the Tau are in all likelihood operating as a society of brainwashed slaves. And while it's true that their goals and diplomatic interactions are far more subtle and arguably positive 
positive than that of the alternatives, I find myself asking what's worse, being forced into a course of action without the ability to have your own free will, albeit debatably and comparatively positive, or choosing with your own individual and intact sense of self to adhere to your society's chosen system, or to abandon it and suffer the consequences, but at least making your own decision and knowing your sense of self. I still would argue that when you look around the galaxy, two races who represent the true, purest sense of purpose are the Orcs and the Tyranids. Yes, both are unspeakable alien killing machines that salivate at the mere prospect of killing in the name of, but does it make them ostensibly bad? Evil even? I think not. Because they're just doing what they do, they're doing what they're designed to do, and the Orcs are loving it. To be clear, the Tau themselves are not a bad race, depending on your point of view of course, but they do have a bleak life once you begin to speculate a little around how the Ethereals control the Tau. They were forcibly indoctrinated into it. Do they have a subconscious understanding that all of this is happening without their real consent? Do they dream of freedom and self-determination, only to awake to another day of reality and mental enslavement? If it weren't for the Ethereals forcibly pushing the Tau toward their goals of total unification, they would as we said still be camped out around each other's settlements, happy to watch each other die of starvation, disease and complete emotional and societal breakdown. A race of forward-thinking, progressive, generally peaceful Xenos who only use violence when they must? If that's how you see the Tau, then maybe the Ethereal's mind control has started to pierce your consciousness as well. It's easy and certainly appealing as to why some would want to see the Tau as being a positive, uplifting and alternative force to the unashamed horror and brutality that pervades the rest of the galaxy. Yet when it comes to the devolved, the vicious or the pretentious entities that qualify as civilizations in the rest of the galaxy, you could at least say that their crusades, their wars, battles and genocides were honest, that they owned their intentions, allowed others to witness them, and knew both the strength of their words and their actions, for better or worse. The reason the Tau, to me, are so abhorrent despite their more progressive veneer, is that in truth they're neither, they live a lie, and worse, allowed themselves to be manipulated into a lie that they're likely not even aware of, and it can surely only be a matter of time for an event befitting the darkness of the far future to occur, where it must surely come to pass that the Tau, through some catastrophic slaughter of ethereals, perhaps some highly focused campaign of assassination by the Imperium, hint, that subsequently throw the Tau once again back into total anarchy and civil war, leaving them ripe for the plucking. This seems to be not simply a plausible possibility, but knowing how events so regularly befall those in the 41st millennium, this crushing downfall based on their precarious structure of fallacy seems an inevitability. The Tau are force for good, they're the worst of them all, and their day of ruination will come. Still, despite the dystopian nightmare that is Tau society, and that they are likely all pawns at the beck and call to so many ethereals, it is still true that the overarching principles of the greater good are more appealing than some other races. If you happened upon some Tau yourself and were generally behaving peacefully, they are for example unlikely to want to skin you alive, as might the Dark Elder, and then parade your skin suit around for the entertainment of others. Nor would they want to dissolve you whilst you're still conscious from the inside out, as giant teeth-bearing maggots infest every space in your body, as might the Tyranids, or subject you to months of endless torture and dogmatic interrogation to reveal irrelevant facts for the purposes of dusty administrative record keeping, as would the Imperium. So while we might deliberately drown ourselves in the bleak horror of the future, you cannot say that it is not the case that comparatively speaking the Tau are the lesser of so many evils, it simply depends on if you're an individual who prefers to deal with reality in a hard and unvarnished sense, or live in the blissful ignorance of the societal, mind-controlling nightmare you're facing. The greater good teaches for lack of a better verb that all sentient beings play an equal and important role in Tau society, that trivial conflicts only disrupt the progress toward a united Tau and fulfilling the greater good. The Tau, unlike other races, have no desires to break down, destroy, purge or otherwise exterminate others' culture. They perceive those who choose to resist their enlightened philosophy with more along the lines of confusion than contempt, baffled to come to an understanding of how these individuals are unable to see the truth of the greater good, which again tells you without direct evidence further suggestion that they are a brainwashed cult who can't see outside their own space. 
To this end, the tower will generally attempt some form of diplomacy instead of operating a kill on site code of conduct, as is often the case for most other races. And as the tower themselves discovered when first encountering humanity, after their failure to respond, the Imperium simply obliterated them with no questions asked. However, the tower are not zombies and have come thankfully quickly to understanding that for some races, attempts at diplomacy are just futile. And so when dealing with the races that we know to be inherently unrelentingly aggressive like the Orcs, Tyranids and to a degree Chaos, they've come to understand painfully that these races are never going to be interested in their strangers just a friend you haven't met philosophy. That being ready for combat when encountering these forces is likely the more prudent course of action and these races have been basically blacklisted by the Tau and they no longer want to try and convince them to join their special greater good club. Thank you very much. The Tau also seek to expand their empire in what are known as the spheres of expansion. These are basically periods of great expansion whereby they will to a degree conquer and absorb the worlds they want to expand outward to. And while the Tau themselves and some of their allies certainly fall under the willful suggestion of the Ethereals, it's questionable as to how other races will behave in this way. It's difficult to know how effective the concept of the greater good will be in uniting an empire that relies in part on a citizenry who are mentally guided by their senior caste. If other races the Tau Empire absorb are less receptive to the suggestion of the Ethereals, it could spell a small or even a significant level of disruption for the Tau within their harmonious order. The Tau Empire consists of the five castes, as previously mentioned, and the castes themselves do not vie for any kind of ranked order, because all their roles, be it a worker, warrior, are seen as equally important to the overall goals of the Tau. Within each caste they do have a ranking system woven into their naming conventions, La being a lower ranking caste member and O being a higher rank. Each caste uses the five universal ranks but then have specific designations relevant to their roles in each caste. For example in the fire caste from lowest to highest you have warrior, veteran, hero, knight and then commander. The fire caste is likely the most well known to those outside the Tau Empire, this is the military and warrior caste. And while often a little shorter in height than an average human and with a muscular build but still generally physically weaker than your average human, Tau generally like to come up with careful plans than rush in with bloodthirsting emotion. They also prefer to hit and run rather than dig in for a battle of attrition. So often their warfare is about drawing out an enemy or making a tactical retreat to gain an upper hand and secure an overall victory. The Earth cast is not singularly about construction and infrastructure, it's more comprehensive and contains engineers, scientists, labourers and technicians. The Earth cast are the builders of Tau cities, but also those involved in the research and development of some of their most powerful technological leaps forward. And while containing your average hard labourer, they'll also have artisans who embellish and drive the visual culture of the Tau forward. The Earth cast ranks lowest to highest are worker, senior, overseer, engineer and planner. The water cast concerns are with trade and diplomacy. They seek to ensure smooth communication and diplomacy both with existing and potentially new allies for the Empire. Water cast often embody the very nature of the ethereal art of suggestion and on more than one occasion water cast have been attributed with turning non-Tau worlds toward the path of the greater good without a shot ever having been fired. The water cast ranks again lowest to highest are bureaucrat, envoy, magister, diplomat and ambassador. The air cast are so in more than just name. They function as the naval force for the town, both space itself and planetary dropship operations. The air cast, though perhaps unintentionally, live up to their title in that many of them bear disturbing physical traits from extended operation in zero gravity, in the form of them having hollowed bones. And this means that they often refuse to step foot on a planet proper because heavy gravity environments can lead them to suffer broken bones very easily. Often considered better pilots than the Imperium can supply due to their more responsive and advanced fighter craft, but the Tau also lack the grizzled combat experience of the Imperial Navy. The air cast's ranks lowest to highest are messenger, carrier, pilot, captain and admiral. Lastly of course are the Ethereals. As discussed already, the real leadership of the Tau Empire and the guardians of the religio-political teachings of the Tau Var. Rarely are they significantly present on a battlefield, but their presence, even if not visible, is usually assumed. The Ethereal caste ranks lowest to highest are Prince, Prelate, King, Holy and Ethereal.
The Tau, unlike most other races in the galaxy, shy away from physical, bloody combat. There are a few Tau who you find punching an orc's face to pieces, or ripping through Imperial armour like it were paper, nor opting for a session of headbutting each other for a bit of a laugh to see who falls into unconsciousness first. Now, for the Tau, when it comes to military engagements, they enjoy two things most readily, fighting at a distance and careful planning. Tau also prefer to get the fighting over and done with as quickly as possible and seemingly lack the stomach for long, drawn-out battles of attrition. The Tau way is one of laying down a powerful strike to crush the enemy as quickly as possible, laying traps and using external factors to their tactical advantage, and to that end, they'll often prefer to abandon an existing outpost if they're outnumbered, regroup, plan and employ an appropriate stratagem to crush the invaders. In some ways, this holds a lot of sense to it. The Imperium while fiercely loyal and always a fan of dying to the last man because the Emperor will judge you, well, while somewhat romantic, it's not especially practical, always. The Tau approach tends to lean towards a logical reasoning disconnected from the emotion of sacrificial loyalty. On the other hand, sometimes the only way to win an ongoing vicious campaign of slaughter in the 41st millennium is by digging in and refusing to surrender no matter the cost, and something the Imperium of Man, Eldar and just about all other races have learned over the millennia. The Tau, while logical seem to lack the real stomach for the grim realities that they face. Realities like alien horrors who have no concept of retreat, or fanatical superhuman warriors who will gladly exterminate every trace of you by any means and any cost necessary if required to do so. There are individual exceptions, of course, and the Tau, moreover, have found convenient ways to get around the fact that they prefer not to get their hands dirty when it comes to meat-grinding battlefield slaughters that are all too common in the dark future. Why fight a battle when you can have your minions do it for you? The Tau will often use the Krut as their melee-based infantry. Now, the Krut are a far more warlike race than the Tau themselves, and they're not only found in the eastern fringe region where the Tau originate, but they are concentrated here. The Krut are deceptive in that they appear feral and savage, but are actually capable of sniping specific high-value targets from enemy units or others such as communication units and so on. They then will emerge from cover to smash the uncoordinated remnants of their targets, and this is where they would diverge from the Tau, as the ensuing close quarter combat is truly savage, instinctive and animalistic. And the Krut are more than happy to take a pause mid-battle and bite chunks out of fallen enemy for a bit of fast energy on the go. And whilst these displays are distasteful for Tau warriors, it's tolerated as the Tau are very aware of the critical role the Krut play for them and will turn a blind eye to such matters. The numbers of Krut and their passion for battle make them an invaluable ally for the Tau, yet they operate far more in mercenary attitude than adhering to the true teachings of the Tau Va. The Tau will, generally speaking, use fairly simplistic and age-old battle tactics of using their firecast units to soften up an enemy at range before allowing their Krut supporting fighters to jump in and take the brunt of the dirty fighting. Krut carnivore squads utilising Krut hounds play a powerful, albeit unpleasant, role here in their ability to track enemy before engaging in brutal savagery. The Krut have even trained their hounds to rip at the weak points of known enemy, the joints of Space Marine power armour, for example. And these squads can also be seen to use Krutox, a large creature who can serve as a mobile weapon platform. And it's believed that Krut eat their prey not simply for sustenance, but they can also begin to over time adopt traits of their target, increased muscle mass for example, or enhanced sensory abilities. They can also begin to display traits from their victim's culture, so they might exhibit not only physical but social tendencies as well. And while this may lend similarities to Tyranids, there's no suggestion of any relation to the same process. In fact, it would be likely very dangerous for Krut to ingest Tyranid flesh, because who knows what invasive DNA they could unwittingly bring into themselves and furthermore open themselves up to developing tyrannic sympathies or higher risk receptiveness to follow the commands of the hive mind should it ever enter the system. One would hope that the Krut would be aware of these inherent dangers. Because of their comparatively weak physique, coupled with the fact that the Tau just generally prefer to fight at a distance, they have to that end developed a range of weapons and force multiplying platforms that enable the Tau to play to their personal preferences. And this means careful planning and tactical analysis. The Tau preference is rarely one of emotional reaction or aggression, but assessing the best possible outcome. And this is another admirable trait for the Tau, and again a relatively unusual one in the darkened galaxy of the future. To be able to make such objective planning, the Tau will even abandon a base if it comes under attack, dismantle important apparatus, and then return later when they have a higher chance of successfully retaking the position. The Tau also will use two primary tactics known as Killing Blow 
and Patient Hunter. As their names describe, these are a highly focused, directed attack to knock out high value targets in a strike effort, and the second more of an ambush when an enemy will be lured from a position of strength into a weaker kill zone before being destroyed. Unlike many forces in the galaxy, because the Tau do not combine their ranged and melee combat as commonly as other races, their tactics and battle organisation also differ to allow for these roles to be appropriately engaged. And this means they're seen to deploy in formations that are ancient to human history, where the Tau with their rifles will form a front rank of range power to soften up targets, while the croup melee will wait behind, ready to leap forward as and when the enemy have closed the gap enough. This will enable the tower warriors to retreat, take up a new position, ready to engage again at a safe distance. And you can likely imagine what Imperial soldiers might think of such tactics. The Tau possess a variety of infantry-based ranged weapons, but it's worth simply mentioning primarily the base pulse rifle. This is essentially the Tau Lasgun, and unfortunately for the Imperium, it beats mankind's offering on both power and range, giving the Tau Warrior the ability to fire extensive repeating rounds. The pulse rifle uses powerful electromagnets to fire a subatomic particle, which then breaks down, creating a plasma pulse upon leaving the weapon. Now, as the Tau utilize electromagnetic weaponry, they also have access to rail guns, which are projectile based and fire rounds as you would expect at an extremely high velocity, the result being, as you might expect, dealing considerable damage to the target. The Tau also somewhat exclusively lean heavily towards using battle suits for their warriors to fight in. Similarly to a Grey Knight's Dread Knight, Tau battle suits are powerful combat exoskeletons, and unlike most other forces that use some kind of exoskeleton warframes as a highly specialised powerful support unit, the Tau use them far more commonly. For the Tau, they make up an important part of the general firecast forces. And additionally, the Tau have been continually making significant leaps forward in the advancement of their technology, and the Battlesuit is one of their highest achievements so far. Battlesuits are more than just powerful tools, they are devastating force multipliers assigned to only the most skilled Tau warriors, and enable a Tau force to lay down suffocating levels of fire or highly focused specific power to punch through heavy high value targets. Combining their railgun tech with smart missile systems, the battlesuits smother enemies with withering levels of fire, their missile systems being particularly feared as cover will not protect, the missiles fire and are drone guided and as such will find a trajectory to their target regardless of cover. Tau battlesuits are formed of a lightweight yet extremely strong nanocrystalline alloy. The suit's angles are formed much like armoured tanks of the 20th century in that their design shapes are hoped to allow solid projectiles to safely deflect off the suit. The alloy is then coated with a liquid metal finish to help reflect varying degrees of laser fire. Despite their specifically different tactics, the Tau are a relatively flexible force, combining both firepower and flexibility, and making use of their advanced weaponry and playing to its strengths in logical fashion. They make use of allies to fill in for their own shortcomings, and make use of simple AI drones to either engage or assist in protecting troops. As with most races, they also sport heavy vehicle weaponry that can deal devastating levels of firepower, and the key difference with the Tau is that their forces are far more specialised than other races. While the Imperium, for example, has specialists, they're usually also capable of taking on multi-roles as necessary. The same to an extent for other races, give or take. And the Tau, though, as with their society, take on a specific role, and that is the limit of their role. In some regards, this can be a positive to have highly specialised forces who know their role specifically and know that role well, but the obvious downside is that once you've lost a specific unit in your battle force, it can undermine your capabilities and your tactics. And this though is where the battle suits come in, as they're highly mobile and able to fill in any gaps across a battlefield, as well as react quickly to changing situations that could place vulnerable units at risk. Now, the Tau Empire would go through multiple expansions in its history, but we begin at the second expansion of the Tau Empire, which was launched with the New Horizon Accelerator engine, allowing the Tau to achieve longer space travel than ever before. The Tau were also now reinforced with their Kroot allies, and a Tau known as Commander Pure Tide would, through this expansion, achieve legendary notoriety, crushing an orc invasion, where through his calculating tactics and Tau principles of long-range engagement, somehow made the prospect of battle unenjoyable, even for orcs. 
Pure Tide was not simply a warrior and commander either. He had mastered all aspects of combat and military tactics and would bring new ideas for Tau warriors to learn from and take a more balanced and flexible attitude to battle. Pure Tide would tutor promising prodigies of the fire cast and many of his aspirants would go on to carve their names and achievements into Tau history themselves. Yet this training would also instill a bit of rivalry between his aspirants who all wanted his attention and approval, yet still they would share a close bond and respect. Now, some of those most notable aspirants were Shasera, Caius, and joining them, Shova. Now, they had all previously demonstrated strong skill both in battle and strategy, and now they were here to learn directly from the master. Each had individual styles to warfare and relevant philosophical thinking to pair with their approach to military engagements. As their training reached completion, each would leave taking their new names and leave to fight as Tau commanders across war zones throughout the Tau Empire. Commander Puretide, though, would suffer serious wounding during the destructive Damocles War with the Imperium, unsure as to if they would be able to retain his experiences in memory memory devices, that is Tau mind capture devices used to preserve the former commander's experience so that it would be accessible by later Tau commanders, and this would be known as the Pure Tide Engram Neurochip. The Ethereals wanted to scan his mind to retain its high value to the Empire. Now these Engram chips would be installed in the minds of Fireblades and Battlesuit commanders, enabling them to function with a common understanding of Pure Tide's experience and adapt to any tactical situation. The unforeseen downside to this was that those who had been implanted with the chip were unable then to draw from their existing own personal experience and so consequently would suffer losses as a result of being unable to adapt to situations that they may have actually had their own experiences with. But this situation also further evidences to the Ethereals having the imagination and the willpower to use mind control devices against lower Tau casts. Later they would be ordered to undergo forced surgery to remove these engram chips with the unfortunate consequence, it left the warrior leaders drooling vegetables. The extraction of the engram chips effectively lobotomized them. Now the Damocles War and many of the events surrounding it deserves far more of an expansive detailing than I can give here today, but for now suffice to say, the Imperium smashed the Tau like a force they could never have imagined. Yet through one thing and another, the Tau still managed to emerge victorious. Yet this initial war with the Imperium left them with a humbling understanding that they had fought against only a small taste of the true power of the Imperium. The Tau leadership made the decision that Pure Tide's existing current pupils should be placed into stasis to ensure that they could call upon his powerful teachings and have commanders available when it was critically necessary. One of these pupils was of course Shasso Shasera, Commander Shadow Sun. Shovar, now known as Commander Farsight, would continue to lead the Tau forces in a period of reclamation to secure lost territory from the Imperium. Additionally beneficial for the Tau would be that the Imperium found itself yet again distracted, this time by the Tyranid High Fleet Behemoth, which significantly diverted their attentions and resources. Commander Farsight would cross the Damocles Gulf, what would be known as the Farsight Expedition. During this time he spent extensive time studying the Imperium, their tactics, and any recorded fragments of useful information he could pull together to expand his abilities in countering and exploiting the humans, while at the same time learning from some of their approaches to battle and tightening up weak points in his own battle plans. With the Imperial withdrawal though, the Orc Menace had already begun to exploit the weakened planets on this side of the Gulf, and so by the time the expedition arrived, infestations of Orcs had already become established and were spreading. Farsight was disturbed by this Orc infestation, so much so that he decided it more important to halt and then totally destroy the Orc threat. This would take priority over completing the reconquest of other Tau worlds, which were now soft targets because of the Imperium's other concerns. This decision by Farsight was directly against the instructions of the Ethereals, who had tasked him with securing the Tau worlds here. After costly engagements on the world of Atari Vo, Farsight's force would return to the Tau enclaves. Yet on returning found to their horror that while they'd been fighting Orcs with great difficulty themselves, in their absence, yet more orcs had assaulted the other Tau enclave worlds. The war boys of the Green Menace ran riot across the Tau planets in space, and it would become clear that the war boss Farsight had been hunting at Atari Vo had in fact doubled back to the enclave space, united the orcs there, and then waged a crushing assault on the enclave planets. Commander Farsight was greatly troubled by his failings here, his lack of vision and understanding that had already proved 
so costly. After placing himself into a lengthy period of reflective meditation, despite all the chaos going on, Farsight would lead the Tao with inspired actions from world to world, destroying the Orc in all manner of creative solutions. Finally, freeing the Enclave worlds from the horrors of the Orc assault, and Farsight himself hunting down the Orc chief and by all accounts besting him in single combat. Farsight had won and restored his reputation, but the threat of the Green Menace still remained, and this would not be the last clash between the Tau and Orc. In fact, notably a distant world Arthas Moloch, whose surface showed little signs of life or settlement, but having just liberated their own enclaves, the Orcs should not be allowed to establish a footing on this planet so near to Tau worlds. Farsight they would encounter a stranger sight of what appeared to be an ancient temple on this seemingly dead world. Orcs who were falling in battle would cause strange bursts of light and energy from the ground itself, an event never witnessed before by the Tau. Farsight was transfixed by this curiosity, until this disk of light and energy would pour out red horned creatures with blades as dark as space itself, screaming unintelligible war cries and slaughtering the orcs. Other pink entities would tumble out from the light, sending out streams of brightly coloured flame that turned any tower they touched to stone, water or screaming scorched bone. The flesh disintegrated from their bodies. Farsight ordered a retreat. But his gaze was caught by this energy, this portal, this connection to somewhere. His eyes were filled with the void. What was this thing? A tear in reality? A gateway to another dimension? It seemed infinite, yet he could feel the call of billions upon billions of deaths. This interaction would fundamentally alter Farsight from here on. He had borne witness to a danger unimaginable by the Tau. But before having time to consider its implications, he would black out, thankfully being retrieved by his warriors and returned to their flagship. As the Orcs now continued to fight on the surface, seemingly spurred on by the violence spilling across the battlefield, the Tau sought to retreat and disengage, and thankfully for them, the Orcs seemed now far more concerned with battling the red-horned aliens and pink-tumbling oddities than they did the Tau, and were throwing themselves ever more aggressively and enthusiastically into the fight as if by some long-trained instinct or rivalry. Yet Farsight would now countermand this retreat. Even the Ethereals attached agreed that they must investigate this new danger. Planet side again, they would re-engage these new aliens, who now were joined by flying creatures bearing axes and whips. The tumbling pink oddities and red-horned sword bearers joined them and Farsight found himself engaged with one of the massive flying creatures. Worse still was the majority of the initial Tau force deployed were killed in short order in any manner of unpleasant fashions. In compounding the agony, an ethereal was slaughtered, cut from head to groin, as its flaccid halves of body would tumble apart in a fountain of blood. A screaming cry came from the Tau re-establishing battle lines, and Farsight would restore order amid the panic and reform teams to continue holding their own. Despite their best efforts though, another ethereal would be gored to death and the fire warriors were now openly breaking. They had never fought foes like this that seemed to appear as quickly as they were dispatched, sometimes it felt like for every one they killed, two would appear. But Farsight had noted that these new foes were avoiding some statues around this apparently abandoned temple. He would see via his suit's visual feed from another battle group, one of the statues wore a hexagrammatic medallion, and even Farsight found that to look upon it eased the pain he had felt ever since looking into the void space. Trusting his instincts, he ordered the battle group to retrieve this object and carry it toward these new horrors. The report came back, it was working. The oddities were retreating at the sight of this object. It was an engagement that no Tau had ever seen before, and as a resulting tactic that was entirely unfathomable to them. Farsight would consider teachings from Master Puretide. To secure victory, the wise must adapt. And adapt he would, ordering his warriors to avoid spilling blood, and if they took any hits to immediately retreat and re-engage. His instincts would prove correct as the red alien creatures seemed to howl in despair, weakened without the blood they apparently so craved and were fueled by. These events that the Tau and Orcs had unwittingly triggered through their orgy of bloodshed, as several of these winged giant alien creatures made for Farsight, he would fling the hexagrammatic medallions toward the energy void disc, and before the aliens could come crashing down upon him, a massive blast erupted from the void portal. Every tower came crashing down into the dust, and as they came to, assisting each other, they looked around to see no sign at all of these aliens from out of the unknown void. The tower here would prove victorious over the orcs as well, but all of this was a hollow victory. The ethereals had all been slaughtered, leaving the tower without guidance. The enclaves had lost their spiritual leaders. It was a catastrophic and unprecedented loss. 
Farsight was even more troubled now than previously though. These creatures, his visions, what were these aliens? Why were they so bizarre in appearance and their abilities and seemingly like the orcs sadistically violent? Why did these creatures exist at all? Did they not have homeworlds and societies of their own? The more he considered it, the more it disturbed him. Was there more to the galaxy than developing your culture, progressing your territory and societal unity? Something far more sinister it seemed lay beyond their comprehension, but not, perhaps, beyond their imagination. Far from Homeworld, and with the ethereal slain, Farsight could not shake his conclusions that there was some alternate, perhaps parallel reality that ran alongside their own. It would explain many things and all seemed to be fitting into place the more he ordered the events and conclusions from his experiences so far. It seemed to command a Farsight that the ethereals must have had some knowledge of this, yet chose to hide it from their people, keeping them in a state of ignorance. He would feel confusion in his own spirit now as well, a sense that the casts here may well be better off without the restricting, controlling ethereals who ordered everyone as to what they should be doing. It had all seemed sensible in the past, but now somehow they seemed cold, uncaring, lacking empathy for their fellow Tau. Were the ethereals controlling the casts? The more Farsight considered it, the more his conclusions about the strange void creatures all seemed to fall into place. It was as if, without the ethereal's presence, he was able to clearly think for the first time, that his mind was unclouded and unrestricted. He disturbed even himself with such thoughts, he couldn't possibly vocalise these thoughts to others, yet these conclusions seemed of such importance and scale that he couldn't simply put them back in the box. His eyes were open, he could see the danger to the Tau was not only their enemies, but now it was himself as well, and his dark, troubling thoughts. Oshova would retreat into self-imposed exile. The Tau already have a detailed history, even for their short existence. And this is not the end of Oshova. And for the Tau themselves, they have only begun to just learn the ways of the galaxy in the 41st millennium. The Tau are a far more complex society than appears on the surface. There are many ethical and moral issues going on with their ideology. And Farsight was the first to see the truth of this. The Ethereals will not relinquish their positions of power easily, and the other pupils of Commander Puretide lie in stasis. The future for the Tau as they begin to see can be no peaceful or simple affair. They will learn the hard way, as humanity has had to for so long, that the darkness and horrors of the galaxy are unrelenting.